Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for the salon. I know you could have lots of other places that you uh, might have chosen to be at, uh, but here we are in this moment after this horrific insurrection that happened uh, yesterday here in Washington, DC at the Capitol building uh, that was um, a horrifying sight for all of us and an experience I think for the entire uh, country as we watched white nationalists uh, who were really domestic terrorists uh, storm the Capitol building and put everyone and democracy in a place that is absolutely painful in this moment. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit tonight um, and also talk about some glimmers of hope uh, within it. Uh, this is our weekly program uh, where I interview innovative thinkers and creative firebrands. And uh, you know, we're living in a critical time in American history with the COVID-19 pandemic a vital social justice movement led by Black Lives Matter. And we try and bring together a group of guests and leaders discussing new ideas. And I think it's more than try, I think we uh, succeed. Uh, I've been so pleased at the wonderful guests that we have. And tonight uh, we have a wonderful group of four. We talk about how they're coping with the coronavirus, making positive so social change. My guests this evening are Alicia Gamble, actress, Sarah Rosen Wartell, president of the Urban Institute, and Ashley Foreman and Maurizio Pita from Arena Stage's Voices of Now program. Alicia is an accomplished actor native to the Washington DC region who performs all over the country. Arena audiences will remember her from Oklahoma and Oliver and many other performances. And Alicia, when you come on, I'm gonna tell you how wonderful it is to see you. There you are. Hi, Alicia. Hi, how are you? I'm good, I'm <laughs> good, I'm good. And I'm really, really happy to be with you, Alicia. Yeah. Good I'm to gonna see you. actually start with a fun question then I'm gonna to get to something serious. I'm just thinking about back to our historic collaboration on Oklahoma that opened our new center, the Mead Center, a little over 10 years ago, if we can That's believe That's insane, 10 years. But also historic because we cast you as Lori and Nick Rodriguez as Curly. And it was really uh, the first time that uh, the show, and the show was a cross-cultural show in terms of its diversity, it was the first time that the show had been cast in this way, not with, with all white characters. Mm -hmm. We were breaking so many barriers with that production. And in the current day with fervent calls for racial equity, uh, do you think back on that as well? Absolutely. I mean, you know, here we are, like you said, it's 10 years since we did that. And, you know, I still have people talk to me about it, you know, even in auditions this far away who, you know, whether they saw it or not, who will see that on my resume and go, oh, you were in that production. Like it still comes up. And it's obviously still resonating in the fact that we've had so many various versions of Oklahoma since then that have kind of taken that idea and run with it. And I think we're seeing that also with, with other shows as well, but it, highlighted how important it is for us to see the world that we all inhabit and to see that we you know belong in this world like the idea of just this monochromatic world doesn't exist even then it didn't exist and kind of infusing that diversity in these gems that we hold so dear is a reminder to people who look like me to go you were there too this is your story. This is the, you know, in the case of Oklahoma, this is the American story. This resonates with you. And I remember when we were, when I was learning the music and George, our wonderful departed uh, music director and friend um, was going over the music with me. and was like, oh, well, you know these songs. And I remember telling him, I was like, George, I don't know these songs. <laughs> I never had any inclination to learn these songs because there had never been a Lori that looks like me. It was never on anyone's radar that I would play this role. And so 
I learned from the show and I learned to love it. And it's one of my, you know, a, a treasured memory was doing that show and having these talkbacks with audience members who would ask us, oh, well, certainly you changed words. Certainly you changed things uh, in the show. And it was such a delight to be like, no, this is the same show. You're just hearing it and feeling it in a different way because you are seeing different people inhabit these roles. This is the world we live in. We all exist here together. It's so beautiful, Alicia. You know, um, it's, it's an example of where theater can actually change minds. Absolutely. Just through interpretation. And, uh, or at least put a little burr in somebody's brain to mm -hmm. look at something in a different way. And here we are in the middle of Washington, DC, both of you and I, and yesterday was shocking. It continues to be shocking today. There are uh, uh, ripples that are running through our city and kind of oceans running through our city, I would say. Yeah. And I just wanna know how are you in the middle of this? Because we know if it was Black Lives Matter out there, people would have been killed. If it were Native American people out there, it would have been a bloodbath. And mm -hmm. here we see white nationalists come in, almost welcomed into the Capitol building. It was, it was devastating. Um, you know, we were, we were online yesterday when we kind of got the notification that the Capitol had been breached. And I remember looking at my phone and looking at the images and my jaw dropped. I mean, I've been to the Capitol building and a few times I've had that honor and I know how beautiful that building is. And there is such a feeling of awe when you walk through those halls, those hallowed halls of our country, of our government. And it's such a wonderful feeling of welcoming and, 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 and grace and to see it being desecrated was heartbreaking. But then to see that there was seemingly no pushback. There was nothing stopping them. It lasted for hours. And then it became anger as well as just heartbreak to see this, this happen. And, and knowing the knowledge that if it were a bunch of people that looked like me, they never would have even gotten that close. I mean, anyone that lives in DC knows how secure those buildings are. You can't go into the Capitol building without a purse. You have to go in with an invitation or by, you know, like someone has to, like, to, 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 you know, so you get invited to go and then, you know, you, you have to go through so many steps and hoops to get through there and to see these people come in with backpacks, so many things, it was, it was devastating. And it definitely, I think for the entire country and world um, put on clear display that there is huge problems in how we treat people in this country that there are clearly, there is something fundamentally wrong with how we treat people in this country, how we police people in this country. And I don't think people can deny that as much as people would like to say, oh, well, it's because of this, it's because of that, they were outnumbered. No, because we have seen time and time again, even when people are being peacefully protesting, you know, getting killed indiscriminately, they are still beat over the head. They are still pushed. They are still shoved. I mean, we just recently saw protesters who were protesting Mitch McConnell in wheelchairs get taken out. They, so they can act quickly when they want to. And the fact that that didn't happen at all and people were allowed to leave peacefully, escorted down the steps was, was devastating, devastating. And I, you know, I, I think we have a lot of work to do in this country and there's the hope that the next administration will, you know, usher in some of the changes that are clearly needed, but it's, it's going to take all of us. It's not, we can't just look at our government to fix those problems because these are fundamental um, problems that exist throughout this country. And we all need to come together and figure out how to fix these fundamental problems. Because if we don't, we will have repeats of this and this will not go away because it's, it's going to be, uh, it's gonna take us a long time, I think, for us to really heal these wounds because they are deep and they've been festering for, for centuries. 
Beautifully spoken, Alicia. We've already ended up at the end of our time I know, that together happened so fast. <laughs> because you also, uh, you gave us that glimmer of hope, Alicia. Mm -hmm. You know, if we all face it, if we all move into it, if we make changes in our lives, if we recognize it, if we have eyes wide open and speak out, there will be change. Yeah, because I think it's clear, we all love this country. We wouldn't be so passionate if we didn't love this country. Like if that is just our one unifying factor, let that be that. We all love this country. We don't want the experiment of America to fail. Absolutely. I love seeing you, Alicia. I love seeing you too. Thank you so much for coming on. It's beautiful to see you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Bye. Sarah Rosen Wartell is the president of the Urban Institute. And Urban is an economic and social science research and policy organization whose more than 550 researchers, experts, and other staff believe in the power of evidence to improve lives and strengthen communities. Sarah has said, I learned the value of having sola, solid data-driven analysis to inform policy decisions when I served in the White House. Urban is uniquely positioned to elevate the debates happening in Washington and in state capitals and city halls across the United States. We have more than five decades of experience conducting the highest quality policy research modeling capacity that enables us to assess the potential impacts of a wide range of policy scenarios and expertise spanning an unparalleled breadth of issues. And boy, do we need you now, Sarah. <laughs> boy, this is a moment. It's great to be with you, Molly. Thanks so much. Great for to be with you. It's great to be with you. So yesterday, we saw an insurrection at the Capitol. Um, and many, many, all, most of the people who were there were there based on misinformation and in some cases outright falsehoods. Does that, how does that impact your work at the Urban Institute? Um, thanks. Um, you're exactly right. What we saw yesterday was the consequence of living in a world where there are alternative facts, um, where uh, it is okay to create um, a, a, an alternate universe for people where they can live on, on, the, on the beliefs or on the, um, with the information swirling around them that supports somebody's interests. And we know that there are parts of the media and the business community and um, uh, many across society who have um, found common cause with uh, a leader. There's always been um, deep strands of grievance um, and sadly hate in our society. But when it's enabled from the White House, when it's enabled, when when leaders in Washington are willing to um, allow the kind of deception that we've seen uh, flourish over the last four years, um, I, I, you know, yesterday was horrific um, and terrifying in so many ways. I've had to deal with my 15-year-old child, you know, trying to understand what world this is. But maybe, just maybe. Um, this is also a sort of litmus test, a moment when we see the consequences of falsehood and truth. And so much of our work is about finding the facts, finding the evidence, debating what worlds we live in, but also what world we could create if we changed rules and changed policy. So um, I'm trying to hold on to some hope after yesterday, um, but it definitely shakes us to our core. Um, to see the, um, how far we've come and how far we have to come back. I love that, Sarah. And I think it's true that this is a little glimmer of hope that we can grab onto. I, I loved also what you said about creativity and I'll take it even further into imagination. How does that inform your work where you are? 
Look, it's interesting. We're a building full of, we're actually a, a diaspora at the moment, but we are a community of social scientists, researchers, data scientists, um, also policy experts and communications pros. But our core contribution is to leverage facts, evidence, find them, and to be able to try to measure and model what works and what doesn't to solve problems in people's lives. And um, we've shown over the last uh, decades, but especially the last four years, that you can have the best facts in the world and you aren't necessarily persuasive. And um, psychologists tell us that people don't absorb information easily, they kind of deflect it if it doesn't fit a worldview that they already hold. And so, you know, my institution filled with people who are enormously fact-based are learning that to connect with people, to be able to persuade means more than having a better data visualization of your, your facts. It means being able to uh, find a shared experience, connect to people through story and narrative. You have to be disciplined enough to use the stories and narrative that are emblematic of the evidence that you found and not just you know, argument by anecdote, you can always find a picture you need. But, but if you are, that, that's actually rigor. That's what social science rigor is about. It's, there's a whole field called ethnographic research about living with and learning people's stories. And what you do and what the, create, the brilliant, wonderful people who are on the show with you tonight do is learn how to tell stories and so that people connect to them. So our hope is that we learn from you and from others in the narrative building world, but we also bring um, uh, the knowledge that we have through our modeling and data science and all that into the world of human storytelling so that we move forward to things that work and make lives better for people. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. You know, uh, storytelling is profound and storytelling that helps drive facts and truth is absolutely uh, the best. So um, bravo to you all for finding ways through to storytelling and narrative. And if you ever need any support in that, we at Arena Stage stand ready to support you. We have many literary advisors and dramaturgs and uh, people who deal in storytelling all the time and are able to take disparate threads together to help build the stories. So let us know. You no, know, we just moved to your neighborhood in uh, Southwest DC. And so I look, you know, and all of us surrounding the Capitol, we just, one of the ways that people connect to story is when there's a shared experience. Yeah. And this terrible moment that we just had was a moment where almost every American had the shared experience of watching the um, Capitol being breached and watching the, the fury and the fear in our hallowed halls. And so there is something in that moment when we can try to shape minds and perhaps uh, build from it. And so it is gonna take the different kinds of tools that your institution and mine have working together to make some progress on that. Absolutely, absolutely. We only have about a minute left, but I'm really curious when uh, you read what do you read? Do you read nonfiction? Do you read fiction? Uh, do you read uh, newspapers? Do you read things online? What is What gives you fuel? Uh, well, generally my um, escape is fiction, but these days I haven't had the attention for it. If I'm really honest, it's, it's hard. I do read for a living through multiple media around me. And so some days, you know, honest truth, I, I binge stream uh, to relax. But I am reading and listening. I've taken to doing my exercise listening to books. I find that is a way to get information. And I've been reading um, right now, actually sampling from both of Isabel Wilkinson's books, Cast, uh, and also The Warmth of um, uh, Other Suns. And Other what sons. I like about the warmth is that it is the stories of people. And Cast is a bit more of a thesis. And so I find in going back and forth, the same themes are in both. Um, it's a little clearer in cast in some ways as you came to it, but there's, it holds you when you read the, the stories in the warmth of other suns. So I, I, it's kind of 
odd, but I go back and forth between the two. Uh, I do too. I, I usually go back and forth between fiction and nonfiction. And uh, Cast to me is one of the most important books I've read in the last decade. It's essential reading. And it causes us, I was thinking today about my childhood growing up in New York on the Upper West Side of Manhattan in a really diverse, interesting neighborhood and realizing how much my understanding of racial inequities and from uh, the work we do, from cast, from so much of the um, reckoning that we've had to do in the last um, few months of, of this country, how much my own understanding has had to grow how much the worlds that I lived in that I thought were inclusive and equitable really weren't. And cast is one of those things that forces you to examine everything in your own life all over again. Absolutely. Well, and highly recommended to everybody who's listening to the program today. And Sarah, we are out of time, um, but it was just a pleasure to have you on and thank you so much. And thank you for all of the great work that you do at the Urban Institute. Thank, thank you. you. to you. Take care. Have See you in the neighborhood. <laughs>
And we had to tell them that the fact that they are willing and 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 willing and open to express themselves and that things are impacting them so deeply mm -hmm. is the thing that gives me hope in a way, mm -hmm. right? It is the thing that drives us forward to say, you care so much about this. I know that the future generations, that you, when you become the, the people in charge, mm -hmm. that we're gonna be in good hands because you care about this so much. And when we're working with younger artists, because not all of our artists, or some of our artists are, are adult artists, but when we're working with younger artists particularly, our job is immediate, it's urgent. It's how can we help those artists craft theater or craft film that will create conversation that could help lead to the world that they need? Because it is their world very soon. So with the events of yesterday, yes, they are resigned, they are sad, they are powerless. And so what are the essential questions that need to be asked to ignite the conversation that is necessary to have right now mm -hmm. with their parents, with their teachers and with their community. So that's where we were, we were trying not to stay in a place of fear and powerlessness, but figuring out how can we mobilize our artists to be able to engage people in conversations who might not believe the same things that they believe. And that is, of course, very hard, but we work with extremely brave theater makers and filmmakers. You know, what's so incredible, and I think there are going to be some audience members who haven't seen your work before, but now you can see Ashley's work, Maurizio's work, the work of the young artists in a film called Inside Voices. All you have to do is go to Arena Stage. Mm -hmm. Go to Arena Stage, go to our webpage, pull it up. Mm -hmm. And it's only an hour long. And I think you all will be fascinated to experience this project because you have about, what, 140, 150 mm -hmm. young people who have, under your guidance, who have created this content. And you can see from the kinds of questions that Ashley and Maurizio are asking, these young people are totally on fire because you guys are on fire. You are fearless about investigating um, some of the trickiest aspects of what it means to be a human being. So you guys are working online. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not you're you're not live. Are there things that you've learned from working online, other than the fact that you now are filmmakers, um, <laughs> that you want to take with you when you get back in person? That's a great question. I, it is an amazing question. I think some of the most incredible opportunities have come from the fact that we can't work in person. We have had the opportunity to use animation to use photography, to use songwriting, uh, we realized that we had to engage the full artist in a way that we never had before. And that is something that I never want to lose. I understand that when we're theater makers, that we have a very specific aesthetic and style as uh, voices of now theater makers, but to engage the entire artist and the way that we have been is something that has completely opened up the opportunity to have deeper conversations and create even greater change with the work. For me, Mauricio? I think we've learned a lot about how uh, their interactions with one another, uh, like, and, uh, some one, some, I want to give you one example that I think it's really interesting, right? Like, okay. you know, uh, young artists and young students that are starting a school year online that they don't know anybody in that new school, right? Because everything has been virtual. The kind of conversations that we're having with it, with them about this has sort of informed the importance of like personal connection. And, and to me, having it virtual is kind of an interesting experiment of like the kinds of, of, of the impact that this is having. And in terms of carrying that through is like, how do we then uh, continue to expand on that curiosity mm -hmm. about our human interaction after we go back to, to being in person? Or do we back fully in person? What stays, what stays mm -hmm. is the big question. I don't know. So interesting, isn't it? Because with you, with Alicia, with Sarah, we're all having conversations about imagination mm -hmm. and uh, curiosity and uh, kind of like, like, like the big questions. 
Yeah. And here we are in this moment that in some ways is, even though we knew something like this was going to happen, what happened at the Capitol, there's a failure of imagination. Mm -hmm. Or is it a failure to believe your imagination? Right. I'll say this, from the moment that we learned that schools were going to be closed back in March, right? Ashley and myself, we dove right in and we said, mm -hmm. the conversation can stop. We can stop, right? This is an opportunity for us to continue to work and have a conversation with them. So in a Before way- the schools even knew they were closing. Yeah, we yeah. instead, I believe that it opened up like a, a world of possibilities where it was, I think, easier for us to, to say, it's easier for us to say, festival is canceled, opportunities are closed. We saw it as a, no, now we have an opportunity to even get artists from India involved, <laughs> get artists from all over the world involved because this is universal. Everyone is being, so seeing the possibility and having that imagination, I think. And I think you're right, Mauricio, that is one final thing to, to really say is that we have been able to, to work with artists in Croatia and Bosnia and Peru mm -hmm. in Bosnia Herzegovina in all these different cities in India over the years in this program. And now we can again engage them as film actors and filmmakers. That's something I don't wanna lose just when we come back in person. Yeah. We wanna to continue to work with them. Well, I'm sorry to say that our time is up. And I want, I want you both to know how happy I am that uh, you are working with young people, with older people, whoever, and opening everybody up to their creative impulse, because that's going to save us. That is gonna save so thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Molly. Love you guys. Take care. You too. So my guess next week will be Rebecca Campagna, Arena Stage School's program manager, Daniela Topol, who's a director and she directed Arena Stage's Intelligence by Jackie Lawton, and Steve Grundman, who is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Looking forward to that conversation. Today's uh, gift of art, Arena has a great lineup of winter classes featuring classes catering to families, to theater lovers, to students, to adults, and emerging theater artists. So today's gift of art is a real treat, a peek at what's available. See you next week. I'm excited to share with you what it's like to work with such a great team in the prop shop. We make the magic happen with the show. We help with the sound and the lights and the moving scenery and everything else going on stage. We're going to talk about the basic fundamentals of lighting design. We're also going to talk about emotional intelligence, which is something that lighting designers use to create all the time. 